Hello and welcome to The Course. I'm your host today, Lee, and I'm speaking with Professor Ka-Yi Lee from the Department of Chemistry, the James Frank Institute, and the Institute of Biophysical Dynamics. She has also served as the provost for the University of Chicago, and she's a former faculty director of the university's Hong Kong campus. Her research focuses on membrane biophysics, including protein lipid interactions, Parkinson's disease, and respiratory distress syndrome. Professor Lee is here to talk to us about her career path and how she became a University of Chicago professor. So, Kai, can you give me a general overview of your career path? All right. So I came to the U.S. from Hong Kong as an undergraduate student at Brown University. And I started off thinking that I would want to major in electrical engineering and theater art at the same time. And as I was going through my undergraduate education, I I stuck with the electrical engineering and I really did my theater singing work as an extracurricular piece, but I have developed an interest And I started taking computer science courses, applied mathematics courses. So I was sort of a little bit heavily on the STEM area. And it was really wonderful to be able to explore different disciplines while I was an undergrad. And and with the liberal education, I also was able to take other humanities and social sciences courses. And so it was a very enriching experience. And when I was finishing up my second year, I started doing research in a lab with a professor that, who was my electrical engineering professor in, in one of the courses. And so, oh, so I got very interested and excited about research. And I remember how excited I was to be able to replicate one of the papers that we were reading in terms of the computation outcome and was so excited. I ran up the stairs because I couldn't wait for the elevator to tell him of the results. And so when I was looking at the next step, I decided that I really want to go to graduate school to pursue a PhD degree. And from Brown, I went to Harvard to pursue my PhD in applied physics. So there's a slight change in the field. And I really want to work with lasers because my thesis, my undergraduate thesis was looking at the transition in, to chaos in two coupled ring laser systems. So I was doing theoretical computational modeling work to try to understand that transition. And I would really want to be able to experiment with in the field of laser laser spectroscopy. So th- with that intention, I went to start my PhD work and joining a lab that does interface using laser to probe different type of phenomena. So my thesis work was really on various type of interfaces, looking at how um, the decay of wave as it goes from the source, as a function away from the source, and, and really looking at what happened to the wave damping when you have a thin organic film at the surface. So one could think of a single molecular layer of materials at the interface really affecting the response of the surface. And I've looked at other berry surfaces as well, but that was really the project that got me excited about how a thin film can actually change the interactions and the behavior of the film. So, you know, this is well-documented even in early Seaman's handbook of how oil over tropical water, how, you know, putting oil under stormy condition can actually calm the surface. So one thing led to the other, I, I decided to really pursue a career in academia. And then I went to apply for postdoc. And I was at the juncture deciding whether I would want to do ultra fast laser spectroscopic work or to really stick with this thin film interactions at interfaces and looking at various type of thin film that has biological implications. And with that, I went to do my first postdoc at Stanford with Heiner McConnell and really looking at the thin film as one side of the lipid membrane and trying to understand how self-assembled molecule forming the the lipid membrane, which is the membrane that delineates what is inside the cell versus what is outside the cell, behave in the presence of cholesterol. 
And from that, I went on to do my second postdoc now in a chemical engineering department. And there I look at lung surfactant, which is this mixture of lipid and protein that coats our air sac. And its main function is really to reduce the work that is necessary for us to breathe. And children who were born prematurely might not have the lung surfactant or might not have the correct amount of lung surfactant. And so what, they, what happens is that they will suffer from what is called the respiratory distress syndrome. So that is a project that I've worked on since the pro star and have continued with it in various guises when I started my independent faculty position 25 years ago in 1998 at the University of Chicago. Tell me about what you wanted to be when you were younger. So you grew up in Hong Kong and Mm -hmm. you mentioned theater earlier. So it sounds like you had varied interests when you were a kid. Yes. So when I was growing up in Hong Kong, I think I was really fascinated. And I don't quite understand why about engineering. I want to be able to build things and to make things that would be useful. So I remember one year I was very excited to get one of the kits, maybe I was 10, 11 years old, that you could have these modular units that you can put in and you can build your own circuit. And so that's sort of the the seed of majoring uh, electrical engineering sort of come into place. Throughout high school, I was involved in debates, I was involved in public speaking, and I I was part of the, the core performance throughout my career and high school. So, so sort of performing and theater has been part of, you know, my existence. And the reason why the open curriculum at Brown University was of great interest to me when I was looking at colleges, you know, from very, very far away, and the ability to really bridge the gap or bridge the seemingly divide between sort of my STEM interests and uh, my interest in sort of performing arts, literature, and all that sounds like a great idea. So I grew up in Hong Kong, and it's under the British systems in which you specialize very early on. So after ninth grade, you have to decide whether you take the art stream or the science stream. I picked the science stream, but I really like my English literature class. However, I would not be able to take that because I already have nine courses that is set for what is the O-level, which is a public examination, the equivalent of O-level, so during a Form 5 open exam. So even I petitioned all the way up to the principal, arguing that it would really be great if I could continue my education in the science stream, but be able to take the English literature course, but there's just no way to fit it in our prescribed schedule. So I have always sort of looked to what's coming to a place like the United States to continue my education as a dream to be able to explore the different kinds of disciplines as we are trying to figure out what we are interested in to pursue as a career. So it's with that mindset that I came to think that I would major in theater arts. But at the end of the day, I satisfy my ability to perform and to be creative by singing in various groups, uh, including a a chorus group, as well as a pop jazz group. And this continues throughout my graduate work, my postdoctoral work, and has been very, very good for me to have some sort of a balance. And Kai, what were you like as a student in your middle and high school years? Wow, I think I was, that's a tough question, let me think back. (laughs) I think in my middle school year, so... I I was sort of, you know, really interested in exploring different things. And uh, I also was interested in sort of taking leadership role, but, you know, allowing me to take on and and gather people and move things forward with a cause. In high school, it becomes more sort of prominent as my portfolio. I ended up being the head girl and the president of the student council towards the end of my high school career. I was really interested in learning and studying, but I was also interested in really arguing and debating and challenging ideas and thoughts. So I also served as the captain of the debate team to compete in joint school debating society. So so those are some of the activities that I have really enjoyed, and I think that they have enriched my life as I was growing up. 
And for some time, I have thought of the idea of, you know, being a lawyer just because I liked debate, I liked arguing. But my the draw to science, the draw to the fascination and the joy of discovery really have put me onto the other path, going into the sciences and trying to understand what are the underlying principle and cause for whatever mechanism that we're seeing or whatever phenomena that we're seeing. Do you think that your younger self would be surprised to learn that you became a professor? Or do you think your younger self would think that made sense? I think my younger self would have been surprised. I came to the U.S., you know, thinking that I would be doing my undergraduate degree with a diverse liberal arts education. But for whatever reason, my dream is to then pursue, pursue a master's degree and to work in Silicon Valley. So, you know, this is someone from very, very far away looking at the development in the U.S. and, you know, with what an engineering degree can do and what we can contribute and how the Silicon Valley is looked upon as a place of great creativity and innovation in, you know, the computer, computer industry. And so, so that was sort of part of the mindset that I have coming in. So I never really thought that I would be a professor and there was no one in my family at that point who was a professor. I, I ended up now one of my uncles is also a professor in mathematics. And so, so he has been someone that I look up to as he was going through his path and we stayed really close touch because he is someone who has a very similar career path as I have. But honestly, I haven't thought of being a professor. But when I was in college, I had really thought of being a professor. And, and, and in fact, the reason why I applied for graduate school in a PhD program is because I like both sides of it. I like the ability to do research, and I'm fascinated by the research, but I also like to eventually be able to contribute to the education of the next generation. So I think but the turning point happened when I was in college, really being exposed to a broad spectrum of ideas and be able to go from discipline to discipline to try out new things and to really be on the receiving end, seeing how impactful a professor could have on a student. And so it was with that mindset that I decided to go for a PhD program when I was applying in my senior year, and I have not looked back from that. I have to ask you, you know, with your expertise, your knowledge, and a little, some of this might be, might have already been answered in the question that I just asked you, but, you know, really specifically, why become a professor? There's so many things that you could do with your STEM background. I think being a professor is a wonderful profession in the sense that you have academic freedom to pursue what is of interest to you. And at the same time, you are constantly being challenged with young minds. It is really fun to be working with your students, with your postdoc on problems that are cutting edge there, where there is no prescribed answer to. And you're really trying to find the truth, whatever the truth ended up being, because there's no right answer that is at the back of the book that you can flip to see if you're on the wrong path or the right path. But it's the process of really solving a problem is trying to add to knowledge that is exhilarating. As I was mentioning earlier, I did spend a lot of time as a junior in college trying to replicate some of the earlier work that was published by others. And, you know, there was a lot of troubleshooting. There was a lot of sort of frustration of not really getting the curve or the graph that was produced in the figure. And I worked day and night and, you know, changing parameters and seeing if where I have a mistake in my codes. But the moment when everything works out, the acceleration, the, the, the joy that you experience is just so tremendous that I really, I literally, my lab was in the basement and my advisor was on the second floor. I just ran up the stairs to tell him how excited I was to just replicating someone's data. And what that allows me to use those codes to really pursue what I was interested in 
and try to find out, you know, how this coupling to ring laser system actually actually changed the threshold to chaos. And that was really exciting. So I think, you know, in a way I caught the bug and, and it was really great to allow me to see how careful planning and being thoughtful in the process can allow you to systematically go and try to attack the problem. We might not get the solution immediately, or we might be able to glean to only part of the solution, but it is really a rewarding ex experience. And I've seen that since in my students going through their own discovery and being the first one in the world to see X and to see the joy and the excitement, and also sometimes the frustration because you know you don't understand or it doesn't work. And so it is really the process that has been thought provoking and keeping you inquisitive, curious, and also young at mind throughout these years. And I want to ask you about the Hong Kong campus, because I know you did a lot of work there. Can you tell me about how you got involved and the extent of the work that you did in creating that campus? Oh, so I remember reading an email from our then president Zimmer, probably in the summer of 2013, sort of articulating that our Booth School of Business executive MBA program would move its Asian headquarter from Singapore to Hong Kong. And at that point, the announcement was just about the Booth School program. And then probably almost a year later, I was contacted by then provost who asked me if I'm interested in being involved as the chair of the faculty advisory committee for our center in Hong Kong. So back then it's still center in Hong Kong with the idea that yes, Booth School of Business would be moving the program there. But if we were to build a campus, it could have sort of university wide activity. And so I was so excited coming from Hong Kong and hearing that the university will have a presence in Hong Kong. I almost immediately said yes in his office without going into any of the details of what it entails, what is the vision. And so th that has been a really wonderful journey. We started off in Hong Kong uh, with a rental space for our activities. And alongside with that, we were working with the Hong Kong government, with various groups to help us build a campus through a land grant process from the Hong Kong government and to, to build this. So we broke ground in 2016 in the summer, and we're very happy that the whole process went very smoothly with support from everyone. And eventually it opened up our campus in November of 2018. Now, as one of the land grants, this is a Heritage Three site, and it has a very rich history. So as part of the land grant requirement that we were asked to really interpret the heritage of this particular site and being involved on the university side, I was the person who chaired this committee. Now, my history is the Sam, Sam, and as I told you earlier on, my connections with the humanities and, and social sciences courses ended when I was in ninth grade. And this is more of a historic project, understanding the history of that. So I, I have to confess that I really don't have the expertise in this area, but I have the enthusiasm and being someone from Hong Kong, I personally am invested in this project because I really want to do a good job in interpreting the heritage and history of the space. But luckily, you know, we put together a very robust committee with colleagues, both at the University of Chicago, and also we seek out to scholars in Hong Kong and in the area who, are, who have expertise in the history of Hong Kong, and everyone helped us to build a robust heritage interpretation center, which now has been open to everyone who visits, you know, not just limited to people from the University of Chicago, but really is open to the public since our opening in November 2018. And we have rotating exhibition. And so it is, it, it is a wonderful learning experience for me and it's most gratifying experience to see an idea taking shape and with help and collaboration with from people from different areas um, and different walks of life to add to our understanding of this wonderful historic site in Hong Kong. 
So what advice would you have for people who are considering following a similar path? I'm also thinking about people who might be coming to the U.S. to pursue academia from abroad. What advice might you have for them? I think coming from abroad, whatever system that you grew up in, I would advise people to really keep an open mind and really use the college education as a way of finding about what you really like. Or maybe you're not exposed to, I mean, we, some, a lot of times we come with a preconceived notion of what we want to be, but that would change. And it's not bad that it changes as you have further self-discovery of what really excites you, what really keeps you up at night, and what really motivates you and how you feel that you can actually contribute to that area. I want people to be brave to step a little bit outside of one's comfort zone at times because you know, the reward can be very large. And so I've seen it for myself and I've seen it in other people through that exploration process that might have discovered a path that deviates a little bit from what you had originally thought of. And that is something that is great as long as you're passionate about that. In academia, a lot of times I think, you know, with what we see as success, as we see in other people, And we might not know that everyone goes through that different steps of failure that is not in our CV. And so it is important to keep in mind that, you know, when you are hitting a roadblock or when your experiments are not working, be positive and be critical of what other steps you might want to take to make the change. But, you know, sometimes we get frustrated and say, well, maybe this is not for me, but I would urge people not to give up too early because we all have gone through that, are continuing to go through that. It's just that sometimes you don't get to see the less glamorous part of someone's career and you think that, ah, this roadblock is just because of me and I'm not cut out for that, whatever that means. So I would encourage people to have patience and be able to see beyond the immediate roadblock and not to be discouraged by it. So, Kai, what do you find most gratifying, most fulfilling about the work that you do? I think it is gratifying on multiple levels. I think as a researcher, as a faculty, as a PI, it's really gratifying to see the development and growth of the students, both in the classroom, but also, in my case, for my, the group that I have, so my students, my postdoc. Because you spend an extended period of time with them and seeing their growth and the development is really gratifying. That, that's what I meant that when you say, when I said that you have an impact on someone's trajectory and someone's future career path. Not that we're molding them, but our actions and the kind of research that we're in help shape and help open their eyes to various possibility. So that is greatly gratifying as an educator, seeing that development. From the university perspective, it's also gratifying to be able to bring people together to work on a common cause and to bridge the various disciplinary divide that might be to leverage the resources that we have to address problems that is cross-disciplinary and also require different skill set to address large problems like climate. It would be really gratifying to bring people together with different perspectives and addresses different areas of that problem. So I think, you know, being at the university and being one that is as diverse as the one that we have with various expertise, it is really gratifying in a position to be able to move things forward together and to bring the frontier of research forward to add to existing knowledge, to push the boundary, as well as to be impactful in a positive way to the world that we live in. Thank you, Professor Kai Lee, for your time today. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. Leave us a comment, subscribe, follow, and share this episode with your friends and family. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. 
Stay tuned for more and thanks for listening.